thank you everyone for coming in to join us um, this afternoon, this evening, this morning, um, and welcome to this wonderful book launch session that we are hosting um, with the Center for Comparative and Public Law at the University of Hong Kong. As you are all well aware, this is a session that's being recorded, um, and we are very delighted to be hosting this session today to celebrate Dr. Nicole Sikluna's brand new book with Oxford University Press, the Politics of International Law. Um, my name is Dr. Courtney Fong, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Politics and Public Administration here at Hong Kong U. And so again, welcome everyone to joining us. Um, I'd first like to thank the Center for hosting the session, and of course, Dr. Sikluna for joining us, and of course, Professor Karen Alter, um, coming in all the way from Chicago, um, from Northwestern University. So if you all don't mind bearing with me for a couple of minutes, I'd first just like to outline some housekeeping needs that we have. So please just to remind you that the two speakers will talk for about a total of 30 minutes between the two of them. And then at any time, please do feel free to put your questions into the chat box. And as the chair of the session, I'll be glad to read your um, handle, your name, and your question directed to each of the speaker and the discussant for the brand new book. And just to please remind you to feel free to chat away. And we'd love to have a lot of great questions as we proceed to that part of the talk. Um, and the next thing I would like to do, since that's all the housekeeping, is I just like to read a very short bio for both of our speakers. So I'll start in reverse order with our discussant first. Um, so our discussant is Professor Karen Alter, who is a professor of political science and law at Northwestern University and a permanent visiting professor at the I Court Center of Excellence at the University of Copenhagen. She has a fantastic publication record and we are very excited to talk about um, these topics with such an esteemed expert. Um, Professor Alter is the author of The New Terrain of International Law, Courts, Politics and Rights with Princeton University Press in 2014. And of course, her um, co-authored book of 2017, also with OUP, Transplanting International Courts. So thank you very much, Professor Alter, for joining us and for having prepared your comments today. And then now I would like to introduce Dr. Nicole Sikluna, who is a visiting lecturer in international relations at the University of Hong Kong. She has had far too many fellowships, far too many excellent lectureships, and has authored far too many fantastic articles for me to list. But we are here today to discuss and to celebrate her brand new book with Oxford University Press, just out this past February, The Politics of International Law. And there it is on the cover with Professor Alter. So exciting, so exciting. Um, so please, I will now mute myself and I'll turn the floor over to, to Dr. Nicole Siklina. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Courtney, for the introduction. Um, and yeah, I also just wanted to thank the Centre for hosting this event. I, I greatly appreciate that. Thank you to Courtney, my colleague, for hosting it, uh, for chairing it. And thank you very much to um, Karen for agreeing to act as the discussant. Um, I'm, I'm really excited, as, as Courtney said, to be able to discuss these issues. Uh, and thanks for holding up the book. I still haven't received my copy, so <laughs> I wish I could hold up my copy of it. But um, uh, yeah, there we go. So what I thought I would do, um, and I do want to keep my remarks fairly brief, but uh, since it is a textbook, I thought that I would focus my remarks more on speaking about um, the process of writing this book and some of the challenges involved um, rather than uh, the content or more so than focusing on the content. Although, of course, I'm happy to answer questions and have a discussion about uh, the, the content or about anything else. So basically what I wanna do is I wanna just give a brief introduction to the project, um, discuss the aims of the book, and then talk a bit about the challenges of writing a book like this, um, writing a textbook on the politics of international law um, and, and yeah, and then I'll, I'll briefly conclude. So by way of introduction, um, this is a book that was based on a, a course that I first taught at the University of Birmingham in the UK uh, to undergraduate students, advanced undergraduate students. And it was a course that I taught mostly, almost entirely to students of political science and international relations who had no background in law or international law, so non-law students. And I thought, you know, when I developed the course on which the book is based, I thought that there was um, scope. I mean, certainly at Birmingham, there was scope for something like this, a course for non-law students 
um, who need to understand, I mean, I suppose this is then one of the key aims uh, of the project. I think it's important for students of international relations to understand international law, to have a grasp of, of what it is, what it isn't, uh, what it does, how it influences international politics. Um, so that's, that has, an, has remained the primary audience of the book. It's, it's for non-law students, it's for students of international relations and, and political science. Um, I mean, as a secondary aim, then, as I, I designed the book, I think and I hope that it would also be useful for students of international law as an introduction to international relations. Um, and so there is also a, a bit of a focus on international relations theory or bringing that in. So for law students, it's to understand, it's to go beyond black letter law. Um, it's to go beyond texts and, and look at that political context. Um, so yeah, so it's based on a course that I first taught at Birmingham and then for the last now I think four years, uh, three or four years, I've been teaching it at the University of Hong Kong to undergraduate students as well as to postgraduate students. So, I mean, I wrote the book over a period of five years. It ended up, I suppose this happens with a lot of book projects, you know, it, um, it, it was not supposed to take that long, but it did. So, so I wrote it basically between 2016 and I just put the finishing touches on at the end of um, 2020. And, and that's relevant as well. I'll come back to it when I talk about the challenges, but interestingly enough, the period of writing the book coincided almost entirely with the Trump presidency. Uh, so I'll, I'll come back to it because that was really one of the challenges of, of writing it. Um, and I'll, I'll explain more what I mean about that. So, you know, what the book is, it's not, as I probably already made clear and the title makes clear, it's not a black letter law book. Um, it is very much a study of international law in its political context. And it's basically structured in two parts. You know, there's a, the first part is an introduction to what international law is, how it's made, and some of the key principles of international law. You know, and again, you know, assuming a main audience of, of students who don't have any uh, grounding in law. And then I take a case study based approach to various substantive areas of law, right? And, and the book covers uh, global environmental governance, trade governance, the use of force, international human rights law, self determination, international criminal justice. Um, in terms of the aims of the book, uh, I think to summarize it in a nutshell, I would say that the key aim of the book is to explicate and analyze that relationship between international law, international politics and power. Um, and the original title of the course was Law, Politics and Power Beyond the State. And, and in fact, that was going to be the original title of the book, but, but OUP came up with the politics of international law, which I think is uh, snappier. So really what I, I want to do and what I hope the book does is to show how international law is made through political processes, but then it very much contributes to framing the political space in which politics takes place. Um, and, and what I try to do with the book is to show that the power and the authority of international law is limited, but it's real. Um, and, and again, I'll, I'll say more about this, but, you know, in, in teaching students, and I'm sure all of us who, who've taught similar courses have had this experience that you don't need to convince students that the power of international law is limited. Um, they come in assuming that. Uh, often it's much more difficult to convince them that, that the power and authority of international law is real. And this may be, as, as I said, especially because I've taught mainly IR students. Um, students who are not coming from a black leather law perspective, right, who haven't been, uh, you know, who are not well versed in, in the content of law or, or, you know, have that as maybe assumption of, of taking it for granted that law works or looking at law in that way. So that's been one of the challenges that, that I'll say more about, you know, is, is to show that um, the power and authority of international law, yes, it's limited, but it's also real. Um, and I like, and I think I use this in the book, uh, Professor Alter talks about, you know, that the, the courts, international courts, for example, that the power they have is not the power of the sword or the purse, it's the power to speak the language of law. Um, and that's what I try to impart on students, uh, that, that, that that is very real, that that legitimacy that law conf confers is, is, is um, real and it has a real effect in the world, right? And that it frames the conversation, it frames the context in which politics takes place. So in the book, I do try to give an overview uh, of the main theoretical perspectives and approaches to the politics of international law. And I do cover all of the major um, IR theories, but ultimately I would say then that there are perspectives that I am arguing against. Um, and so I, I do reject or push back against the, the, the realist IR dismissal of international law, 
as nothing more than a byproduct of politics. Uh, you know, I present that, but I try to push back against it. I mean, I do find, and I would be interested, you know, to hear what, what others think, but I do find that when I teach this material at the outset of the semester, um, the majority of students at the outset do tend to take that realist type perspective of assuming that international law is irrelevant. That tends to be the majority. Um, I found that in Birmingham, and I think probably even more so uh, with my Hong Kong students. So I, I then, in the book, I aim to present international law as neither simply the byproduct of politics, um, but nor is it a neutral set of rules. Um, uh, so, you know, and I, I also try to avoid presenting it as, as yeah, some kind of objective um, or neutral set of rules or, or you know, just, uh, just because then you also have students who would take the view that international law is kind of good and pure and is to be contrasted with politics, which is bad and corrupt, right? So, so there's no such easy dichotomy, right? So I suppose, in other words, um, international law is much more than power politics writ large, um, but it is very much grounded in a political and a historical context. Um, and that is a context of, of deeply unequal power relations. Um, so, so there is no straightforward dichotomy between a law bound international order um, and an international order that's ruled by power politics. Um, and, and here I come to a related aim of the book that, that we discussed a bit already with Karen in our email correspondence that um, another aim was foregrounding and highlighting the colonial context in which international law developed, um, that, that heritage and that baggage really that persists to this day. Um, and that is actually probably, you know, there, there have been some interesting differences in, in, in teaching this material in the UK versus teaching it in Hong Kong. And, so, you know, when I taught it in the UK, for example, I made much more of a point of, for example, problematizing the idea of universal human rights, like the, the concept of universality. And I found in Hong Kong that I didn't have to work as hard to problematize it, right? That, that, that students would be more likely to say, yes, you know, these are basically based on Western values. And, you know, we can, we can have a, a, a debate about that um, to the extent to which they're universally valid. So. So in the book, I tried to kind of do justice to, um, to that colonial context, as I say, and even and colonial baggage, um, particularly by bringing in the perspectives of, of third world approaches to international law, um, which is yeah, something that I try to bring in uh, through the case studies in relation to, to a number of the substantive areas, including international human rights law, but also trade um, and other areas. So that, that basically then covers the aims of the book. Um, and then I, I wanted to say a little bit about the challenges um, of the project. And I mean, one is just quite simply doing justice to the breadth um, and depth of, of, of material, right? Both in terms of possible empirical coverage, but also the theoretical perspectives. Um, and so, you know, hopefully if, if those of you out there are interested, please order the book and you can uh, see if I did a good job um, of that. But also, as I said, uh, you know, you, you don't have to convince students that international law is not always uh, very powerful, that it has its limits. Um, but, you know, you often do have a hard task of, of convincing them that international law has, has a real effect in the world, especially on great powers. So that was a challenge in writing the book, was, was kind of writing it, was addressing the student cynicism that you know there is. Um, and not... Uh, being unrealistic or naive or too idealistic about what international law can achieve. Um, and again, I, I do have not, not just saying this because Karen is our discussant, but Karen's work was really inspirational for this, like, you know, looking at something like international courts um, and giving a realistic appraisal that, yeah, you know, that what are the limits of what international courts can do in terms of uh, you know, compliance with their decisions. But um, the achievements that international law has made and, and the achievements of judicialization, I mean, these are really uh, very real. Um, so yeah, arguing for the power and potential of international law, you know, without either understating its limits or idealizing it, that, that, that was one of the challenges. Um, another thing was, yeah, so situating the present without distorting it. And again, you know, that the time frame is an issue here. So I wrote it between 2016 and 2020. And there's always, I think that's always a challenge when you're writing about the present. You don't want to overstate the present moment and the significance of it. Also, you know, and, and this is then something I discuss in the conclusion is the, uh, 
liberal international order such as it exists and you know there's recently there's been a lot of literature on the crisis and there's been a lot of not just scholarly literature but basically public debate about uh, whether the liberal international order is collapsing and so there can be a tendency in the present moment to always you know we're in this perpetual crisis and it's the worst it's ever been which of course I try to do this in the conclusion uh, we can really ask we can to, to what extent there ever was a liberal international order or when was it not in crisis um, so yeah so situating the present without distorting it and that is tied to the other challenge that I really had uh, which is how to address the role and in some ways the outsized role of the United States and again so I say here that you know when I wrote this book it pretty much uh, completely coincided with the Trump presidency and so I am already a little bit paranoid that I overstated um, the impact Trump had on international order on international law you know I, I hope that I didn't make too much of it but the book was written in that period and so you know I mean I would I was writing I, I actually remember when I was writing a section about landmines and trying to make the point about uh, the interaction you know a kind of constructivist point about um, the norm creation and norm change and, and that you have uh, a legal norm that that you know is so it's codified in the landmine treaty and this affects a kind of uh, in a, an underlying norm that, that the use of landmines is abhorrent and so on, and that I was going to make the point that even states that haven't signed the landmine treaty in the US was the best example, had moved their practice into line with it. And I pretty much just wrote that and then read that Trump had changed the US's um, landmine policy. So re rewrote that section. Actually, the latest I read is that despite what he said on the campaign trail, that so far Joe Biden is keeping the new Trump landmine policy. So um uh, there you go but yeah that was a challenge and that was that even came through in in some of the feedback i got from reviewers and there there was an interesting difference because uh there was in particular the chapters on the use of force um i got quite a bit of pushback from a reviewer who i mean they're all anonymous but i was told by the editor was an international legal scholar as opposed to an ir scholar that i had um overstated the significance of the US and basically what are US violations of US ad bellum, um, overstated the significance of those. Um, and, and, and so I think that reviewer was coming from a more of a, you know, the law is the law is the law type of perspective where this is the law and violations of the law are violations, right? They don't change the fact that this is the law. Um, but of course, you know, especially when you teach this kind of material to IR students, uh, it's, it's not a very satisfactory explanation if they see such a complete disjuncture between law on paper and law on practice. Um, and it is also hard to ignore the outsized role of the US, right, in, in um, you know, and, and the significance of its violations and the fact that, you know, US practice potentially actually um, shifts international law uh, in, in some ways. So, yeah, all of those were kind of the challenges I faced um, in, in, in writing it. Um, I think I'll, that's all I'll say about uh, the challenges for now. And as I said, I'm happy to, to discuss any uh, questions. But so basically, I suppose um, I'll, I'll conclude by talking a little bit then about continuity and change, which I've already mentioned. So, you know, I hope that this book will then uh, you know, retain its relevance and will stand the, the, um, the, the test of time, so to speak. Um, but then I do try to bring that in at the end, as I said, reflecting on the fate of the so-called, you know, I don't want to use that phrase, so-called, but the liberal international order such as it exists, uh, and, and reflecting on the role of different actors in that order. Um, actually, I should say this, this was one more challenge that I, I wanted to mention, was about the role of states versus other actors. So. You know, I, I suspect in the end that the book is probably still more state centric than I would have liked, and maybe more space could have been devoted to the role of non state actors of various kinds. Um, but at the same time, I, I did feel that it was important to emphasize that um, in, in many respects, we do still live in a world of states. So, you know, so the book does focus a lot on um, states as actors, but also on the principle of, of sovereignty as both a legal and political principle and, and, and situating that. 
Um, but yeah, so then I try to conclude it by reflecting on uh, certain actors, particularly states, uh, talking about rising powers, revisionist powers, uh, status quo powers, but also again, problematizing those categories, right? because there is an inherent normative bias in describing some actors as uh, as status quo and some as revisionist. Um, and, and so then I do try and I hope I succeed in avoiding that tendency of, of presenting the current moment as some kind of uh, unique crisis, right? That the liberal international order had been fine, everything was fine, right? Until, until Trump came along, which would obviously be a distortion. Um, you know, and of course, you know, I mean, Trump's rhetoric was particularly vulgar, I would say, but in, in many ways, his policies were not completely out of line um, with previous US administrations. I mean, particularly the administration of George W. Bush was fairly hostile to established international legal principles. Um, and also to you know, international organizations, multilateralism, and you, know, you have certain uh, real points of continuity like uh, John Bolton and the administration and his attitude to the United Nations or to the International Criminal Court. So ultimately then, um, I, I hope that students come away from the book with a firm understanding of, of what international law is, um, what it isn't. Um, the fact that, yes, it is much more diffuse than domestic law. Uh, it can't be as easily located. It's not created by a sovereign, um, you know, but, but it's, it exists. We can identify sources of international law. We can identify processes through which the law is made and changed and the actors that are significant to that process. And, and you know, it, the, the picture is definitely not as neat. It's nowhere near as neat as, as a, um, or coherent as a domestic legal system, but that there is an international legal system. Um, it matters, it affects politics in important ways. Um, but I also hope then they come away with, with an ability to, to question and critique, um, you know, whose interests international law serves and how that came to be and why, um, how international law could be improved, right? what its purposes are, um, what its purposes should be. Um, and I think basically um, I will, I'll finish on that note. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sikluna. Professor Alter, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm thrilled to be here discussing this book. Uh, I've been teaching international law now, it shows my age for 25 years. And I started teaching it having never taken a course in international law. So it was not part of my undergraduate education. Um, and also a sign of how long I've been teaching this, two of the books I've relied upon have gone out of print. So I've already had to change twice. Um, and I should say the context in which I teach it is a little bit different than your context. So it's in America. And for us, law is a secondary degree. So a lot of my students are going to want to go to law school. And um, they. so in that sense, I, I presume that most of my students are pre-law and that some of them might have international relations. I also wanna make the class accessible even to first years. So I don't even require intro to international relations to as a prerequisite to take the course. So many students are in there because they know about American law and think I wanna know also about international law. So that really changes what uh, the way in which I would uh, teach it. But that being said, when what I've realized as my students have challenged me and as the context have challenged me that the law I was teaching was a completely European version of international law in a completely not self-aware way. So one of the ways in which I really like this book is that it actually brings the real context of the real historical context and the current context that international law faces by bringing in the colonial and post-colonial perspective, the third world approaches to international law. And I should say, I, I also learned how important this was when I've gone once to Hong Kong and China, and I did a bunch of presentations there uh, to mostly law faculties and law students. And every time they brought up unequal treaties. And that was entirely the Asian lens through which international law was this domination of unequal treaties in unfairness. And that's that was a lens that they brought in. Um, American students are quite ready to believe that the United States is not this paragon of good and virtue. Uh, and then they are realists like uh, British students were. And so I do wanna show how law matters, but it's led me, um, the context in which I teach has led me to look for books that had a lot of primary materials, which would lead me to more of the law-based books, 
Um, and there, so there were either books that were all text and all description or all law. And this book is a mix of both because she has a lot of boxes that give you cases, including really current cases like the COVID crisis. And that will make it really uh, speak to today's students because not only is it up to date with its post-colonial sensibility, but it's also up to date with the kinds of cases in which it teaches. So in preparing for this, I was kind of struggling or struggling is too strong. I know I need to revise my class further. I teach it every other year because I try to rotate the classes I teach. And so one year I teach ethics and international relations and another year I teach uh, politics of international law among other graduate and undergraduate classes. And I, and I alternate that to make very clear in both that ethics is not law and law is not ethics. And so I'm, I'm clear and I can refer students to the other class. There's actually a lot of things about the way that law gets constructed that is highly unethical. Um, and so I really want them to be aware of the difference to not let law define what is ethical. You need an, an ethical framework to do that. Um, so I teach it every other year and I had taught it once then during the Trump administration. And now I'll need to update it into a more post-colonial context because our students are really demanding that. And I'll use um, Dr. Shkluna's book to do that. Uh, and, I, and I myself have had to kind of go through a re-education from what I was taught that the history of international law was. And um, so the other challenge that I face is that the way law is taught and the way, and the way law is ex experienced by students today is through conflict. So in law school, because it's an adversarial legal method, it's all of the gray cases. Because if you had a black and white case, the lawyer would say settle. You know, don't even fight this because you're gonna lose. And so they don't read all of the cases that are so clear cut that people will not fight about it. And then they get this viewpoint that all of law is contested and all of law is gray. And that's really not true. And it's not true for all international law either. So the, the way I try to counter the realist is to try to say the many ways in which international law is also not contested and also constitutive of how um, interests are understood. So rather than pitting theories against each other, which I know if you're gonna be in an IR context, you'd want to do that. You'd wanna help the students see how their theories are lenses and windows into understanding a range of topics. For me, I want to stress law in the books and law in action and law in its constitutive and regulative role and where conflicts are and then how power comes out when conflicts arrive. Um, the other challenge I have in teaching in my context is we're on the academic quarter system, which means our quarters are way too short. So I really can't cover everything. And what I've gone to doing um, is doing about four weeks of just like, what is international law? How is it made? Showing the politics of how it's made just to give them enough tools so that we can then pick topics. And then I let the students pick the topics um, from a, a menu that I give them. And uh, the, the topic that I pick is law of the seas because, uh, and, and I've talked to Dr. Skluna that that's um, not in this book. And for me, it's a really key one. And I pick law of the seas because the students won't pick it because they'll find it's too boring. Maybe they would pick it in, in Asia because the South China Seas is you know, an incredibly important and hot topic. And if American students are aware of it, they should be aware of it. Um, but the reason why is that that is to me, international law in its best context. Um, it's the global commons, it's regulating the global commons, but also when you get to the UNCLOS three, the third law of the sea, you see how they really invented this idea of exclusive economic zones. And they did that to alleviate a lot of the conflict that had already existed over whose fishing waters and who could explore in this water and that water it certainly didn't alleviate all the conflict as you all know who live in Asia, but it, it solved so many disputes and then to put fishing vessel disputes also under the, the tribunal of the law to see. But you can really see the regulative role of international law in avoiding conflict. The other thing I really like about that case is that the United States got 98% of what it wanted and still wouldn't join the, the treaty. And when you ask, you know, why is, why is the United States still not part of the Law of the Sea Convention? This is a convention that um, 
even Sarah Palin endorsed ratifying. It's like every single interest in the United States has endorsed it. From the Navy who wants the guarantees and wants to be able to board ships that it suspects are transferring uh, weapons of mass destruction, to industry that wants to be able to explore the deep sea bed. Everyone wants to sign and you're like, what is wrong with the United States that you can't get 98% of what you wanted and every group wants you to sign and you still don't ratify it. And the world rightly goes ahead without the United States. And the answer there is ideology and the fight over the deep seabed if it was the common heritage of mankind. And so that as well starts to help, I think, Americans see the complicated uh, relationship that the United States has to the law of the seas. And then when we get to the International Criminal Court, you, people would say, well, why would they listen to the, the United States on this? The US has a reasonable position, many would feel. And to me, the litmus test of is like, first ratify the law of the sea. Because not only did the United States not join the Law of the Sea um, Treaty, we renegotiated in 1992 and then got, so let's say we first, the first round we got 95% of what we wanted. In the second round of negotiating, we got the other 4%. And still, even after we renegotiated it, we didn't join. Because in the United States, you need two thirds of the senators, which means that at one third blocking, and those are the even before the Trump, they're the, what we call um, rhinos, Republican in name only, refuse to sign the Law of the Sea Treaty. Uh, so I think it starts to show the regulative and the tensions in that. By letting my students choose the topics, and here I need to wrap up on the time, the topic that they no longer choose is human rights. And that in itself um, is an important thing for us to reflect on as we think about the future of international law going forward. They, they don't choose it because we don't have enough weeks and because they're, they're like, I need to know something about trade. I need to know something about um, uh, maybe international criminal law. There's this ICC I don't understand. They choose R2P over that because they've heard about responsibility to protect. And, and I don't really know why they don't choose human rights. I don't know if it means that they don't believe in it as much anymore. Uh, I don't know what that means about the international liberal order, but I find that really interesting because um, there's two ways in which international law in the post-colonial context has been really fundamentally different. Uh, and one of those key ways, one way is the multilateralism and the, and the process that it creates and the courts and tribunals, which are part of that. But another way is that it actually speaks to individuals. It's no longer simply a contract between states. And by speaking to individuals, it transfers into what I talk about in my book, a rule of law mentality, which is that it's not that you're just breaking a contract that states agree to live by in their relationships between each other. It's that if you are a rule of law actor, you follow the law and that human rights law and international criminal law speaks to how governments treat people is a total paradigm shift. And it's also a fault line of international law is exactly what more sovereignty jealous states and what China resist. They would like to keep it in that box of a contract between states and it's a box that it no longer fits in as a formal legal matter, but it is uh, where some of the struggle still continues. So I'll stop my comments there because I'm out of time. Well, thank you so much, Professor Alter. Some excellent discussion already between both author and discussant. And I had a couple of people putting their hands up. Um, there's no need to do so. Please do feel free to turn off that putting your hand up icon and to please feel free to use the question and answer box that's available to everyone in the audience. So I already have a very good and meaty question, a rather hefty one, um, from Ashley. And Ashley notes that they are interested in a short summary of how Dr. Sekluna would push back on the almost fashionable challenge that international law has no real power to influence state behavior. I imagine that the answer is covered in depth in the book, but perhaps there are a few key examples to point to now. So I guess I'm gonna take that question live and the floor is yours. Okay, um, thanks. Yeah, that is a meaty question and, and puts me on the spot a bit. Um, it, it, is, it is difficult actually to push back against that. So uh, students do tend to assume that international law 
has no power. Uh, or that it, it's that it's um, or you get the more cynical view, and I think this has especially been the case more with my students in Hong Kong in the UK. That it's a, a tool that powerful states use against weak states, so that international law is is quite powerful against weak states, um, but not against powerful states. Um, I suppose, and maybe I'm just not uh, thinking very clearly. It's hard to come up with a very clear example of international law really being used to constrain a great power. But I think I, I, firstly, I would go back to something really important that Karen said, that it's, it's um, easy to see uh, the spectacular violations of international law and harder to see the routine ways in which it works. Or, you know, in, it's harder to see the cases where there isn't a conflict because you just have law playing its regulatory role. Um, you know, I would have students asking why states take their disputes to courts at all. Um, and, and there, you know, you can look at examples where it's in neither state's interest to, you know, so there is a dispute and both states want to resolve it. Um, and it's in neither state's interest to have an armed conflict. And, you know, so ultimately then both may choose to go to, to um, an independent arbitrator and accept that decision. Um, it is harder, and I must admit, like, the, 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 I suppose uh, talking about this right now, and this is something I was reflecting on, is maybe a particularly kind of depressing time, because of, obviously one of the things going on right now is, is the latest conflict in Israel and Gaza. And, you know, so it seems like, you know, a, a terrible, depressing example of, of the absence of international law. Um, and sometimes the best I can do with my students is to point out that conversations are being had in legal terms in the language of law and that law is being used to put pressure on the actors. Um, and, you know, so it doesn't give the kind of satisfaction we would like necessarily, um, but the language of law is used to bring actors to the table, um, to encourage moderation, you know, to encourage um, compromise. Um, yeah, or, you know, or for example, now in relation to the United States and, 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 and putting pressure, you know, on the United States to call for a ceasefire and the language of law is used and the language of multilateralism is used. And then, you know, we can only hope that that has an effect. So, yeah, I'm probably not giving a very satisfactory answer there. I'll have to uh, think of you some do, more. I think a better answer if you'll let me. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, the law of the sea, as you can see, I'm a huge fan of. So part of what I do is I talk about the counterfactual of what's not happening. Okay, and it, it's, it's where things are not happening that you see the force of international law. So back in the colonial days, force was used all the time to force the repayment of debt to open markets. And the fact that force is not used in those many contexts now, that it's not even considered valid, that if someone defaults on loans that we own, we're not gonna send our military there, nor are we gonna seize all their assets in the country. We're gonna go through a legalized process and fight about it. Even if you want to take the Israeli dispute right now, they've transferred into the legal arena a property fight. It's not politically working. It's a problematic way to just say that what's happening between the Palestinians and the Jews is a property fight. That's what the Israelis would like you to see it as. But that you transfer something into law and you don't just say it's mine. Israel's all the time trying to play around the idea that what it's doing is not forced expropriation, it's not a war crime. That is how the language is getting, is taking over the way that the dispute is seen. But if you want to talk about a powerful state being pushed back, why does the United States not board every ship going from North Korea? And there was even a, a time when a ship was literally going from North Korea to Yemen in the lead up to the, to the Gulf War, when the U.S. wanted to board the ship because it thought it had missiles on it. And it, it matters that it was in the lead up to the Gulf War because the United States was trying to build a coalition of support. And it knew if it so flagrantly violated international law, then these other countries would not join our coalition of support in the context of the war. But the US tried brinksmanship. It got close to saying, we're gonna board this ship because we suspect it has missiles. But that would be such a complete violation of international law because if you don't know, a ship is literally like a piece of territorial sovereignty that's floating in the water. And so it belongs to the flag country. And so you would, it's, a, it's an invasion to board a ship without permission. And the US did not board the ship, which was also why the, there was so much pressure in the United States to join the Law of the Sea Convention, because then maybe you could collectively negotiate a set of conditions 
under which you might be able to board a ship that you suspect to be transporting weapons of mass destruction or missiles. And that constraining feature and the way in which the United States does not just do what it wants to do and how you're going to have to renegotiate as a collective is, I think, an example of international law constraining powerful states. Thank you very much. I, I am just going to quickly abuse my power of the chair and actually ask a question. We've got a few questions in the queue. So to please encourage everyone to keep adding your questions into the line, please. But if I may actually, while I have these two IR and legal scholars on the on the session with us, I'd be very curious. You know, there are, there are moments when um, actors who are very clearly well-versed in the use of international law opt not to use formal legalistic means, not talking about discussing a new treaty content. Um, they're not interested in trying to have some type of formal legalistic agreement. Um, for example, if we think of the efforts at the UN at the moment to have the these open-ended working groups to do with cyber, to do with emerging technologies. And they're of this belief that the technologies are moving so fast that therefore trying to negotiate some type of treaty that would take years is far too slow. And we need to develop a common normative language. We all have to understand how we'll understand the meaning of deterrence um, now that we have a new set of cyber tools. So I'm just interested for your sort of views about when, if and when we have this almost forum shopping and when legal instruments, formal legal instruments are purposely set aside for these so-called new cutting edge topics. And I'd be very curious to hear both your takes on that. And then I will stop abusing my position as the chair and go back to the actual chat function. So please everyone keep adding your questions. Thank you. Maybe if I can put you on the spot again, Dr. Sikluna to ask you to go first. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, I think often that is then about um, flexibility and, and states not wanting to be constrained. I mean, it's also true that the process of, of creating a treaty, writing a treaty, getting it ratified, it coming into force with technologies that are moving very rapidly, um, it's, it's probably uh, potentially a problem that, uh, that these processes take years. And so by the time a treaty is ratified and come into, comes into effect, that you may need to think about renegotiating it. Um, yeah, I do think a lot of it is about flexibility or that not having clear-cut rules suit some actors and again potentially suits more powerful actors that then have more room to maneuver uh, I mean something I tried to cover a bit in the book and you know if I get a chance to write another edition it's something that by then I think will be even more significant so I'll try to get into it more is the potential for cyber warfare um, and what are the, the legal rules that pertain to cyber warfare and, you know, so there is um, a lot of writing on this, there is guidance on this, um, but there's no uh, specific treaty. So, I mean, the, the current situation is that basically um, the rules of this ad bellum and, and, you know, international humanitarian law are kind of applied as would fit to cyber warfare. Uh, you know, so can, you know, so for example, you know, can there be a right of self-defense against a cyber attack? You know, theoretically, yes, but, you know, we're, we're working with the existing Yusabellum or the UN Charter to kind of think about what an armed attack would look like in the cyber context. And, you know, the generally accepted idea is that it would have to be an attack that causes a lot of kinetic or material damage. And, you know, there's debate about this. But so, you know, there's a school of thought that um, this is quite unsatisfactory to just rely on existing rules of law that, you know, were not designed for cyber. Um, but it's so hard to get agreement. I don't know if this is something that's um, becoming more difficult. And there again, you know, I, maybe I'm in danger of, of overdoing the present moment and the sense of crisis, but um, it, it can be extremely difficult, obviously, to get the kind of consensus that you would need to get um, a, a multilateral treaty with a lot of buy-in. So you end up with this kind of, um, patchwork where you're, you're applying bits of customary international law or, or bits of existing legal regimes to new technologies um, and, and the kind of agreement isn't there to move forward on a new comprehensive regime. So, so let me begin by challenging a little bit the premise of the question, which is that a treaty is better. And so one of the cases that just kind of weaves through my course is the environment where we see the Montreal Protocol is one of the most successful environmental treaties and treaties period. Um, but we tried a hard law regulation of the environment. That would be the Kyoto Protocol. Mm -hmm. 
and we realized that um, we needed a soft law tool. That there's often a trade-off between a hard law because states won't commit to lock into themselves, sometimes for national legal reasons, for legitimate legal reasons, uh, and sometimes just because they it's too constraining. And that soft law, or even negotiation and not soft law or general principles can be a better strategy. So we don't want to assume that it is a, the right strategy. But let me take your example of cyber, which I do think will actually eventually be regulated. And I have a, um, a book chapter that I wrote a textbook, but they let me also post it on SSRN called The Future of International Law. And I do try to think about uh, some issues that are a challenge, including cyber. And there I rely a lot on an article by um, Martha Finnamore and De uh, Duncan Holloway, where they, in the American Journal of International Law, where they do say it, it will be eventually regulated. For me, the challenge that we have in cyber is that there's an area that we could regulate right now, and that would be how to deal with non-state actors, the, you know, the cyber terrorism, the ransomware and things like that. And you could do that through kind of you want to criminalize it in both countries because you want to have extradition be possible. That's probably naive to say because um, you know we know that that Russia is holding a lot of uh, cyber uh, ransomware people there, and they're probably perfectly happy to have these people annoy the West. <laughs> um, but I do think with that when we're talking about how non-state actors might use cyber in ways that we don't like, that that states could probably come to agreement on that, but they're not going to come to agreement on regulating their own tools of weapons because they're not going to want to reveal that. And then you have to say, well, would a cyber agreement that takes half the question and not the other half be the agreement that you want? And especially because do you even need a cyber agreement to get to the first half? If what your goal is, is to have it double criminalized for extradition, maybe you could do that through a series of bilateral agreements. Maybe you could do that through um, soft law. And so there are some real strategic questions about what is the best means to the end, given where states are now, given that there is a real security concern about uh, they don't want to show their hand, and given that right now only a handful of states is kind of like the situation of the NPT, the nu Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, only a handful of states have the cap capability. In the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, you wanted to lock in that capability and, and not further the spread of nuclear weapons because they were so dangerous and hard to disassemble. I don't think that cyber has the same problem structure, we would say, of that. And so what is the incentive for a set of powers who actually can use cyber tools to tie their own hands versus the other ones who, um, who are, are not going to be able to develop that capability, or even if they are, the regulatory, global regulatory rules wouldn't necessarily shape that. So I do think it's a practically also a challenging, like, what are you hoping to get out of international law? Do you need international law to get it? What are states willing to agree to at this moment? What would show too much of your hand? It's a challenge. But I think it will be eventually regulated or woven into the fabric of international law. We're going to have to define acts of aggression. Currently, the General Assembly definition and, and the definition in the ICC. I don't think it'll ever go into the ICC unless act, unless cyber tools causes mass death, because the ICC is about killing lots of people. If it just cripples you, it doesn't cause mass death. But it's going to have to come into an act of aggression, right? So it. We might not then have a cyber treaty, but we might have some understanding of how certain cyber attacks are an act of aggression. Thank you very much for some very detailed answers. I'm also a fan of the Fenimore and Hollis article and their use of the term plasticity and the idea that somehow these norms might be a little bit more flexible compared to a more fixed understanding of international law. But clearly, international law is not a dead black letter law that is not a living object either. Um, we have another fantastic question. Thank you very much. This is from Professor Jaco Husa, so a former colleague also at Hong Kong U. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is a rather detailed question, so I'll read it out all in detail. How do you conceive international law in relation to more recent emerging areas of law or normativities, if you would prefer, like transnational law or global law? Both of these are understood in various ways and are undoubtedly flexible notions, yet they seem to challenge the traditional understanding of law that exceeds borders of states. 
Is it possible to discuss politics of international law without also addressing the transnational global um, emerging non-national bodies of norms that take shape and come to existence differently than international law made by states and international organizations? Norm making power is in the hands of big corporations and other private non-state actors. Is their role in law making also something that fits under the heading of, quote, politics of international law? Or is it something else, perhaps? So fantastic questions all wrapped into one. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, Dr. Sakluna, may I put you again first, if that's OK? Thank you. Sure. So, yeah, thanks, Professor Husa, for the question. And I know, I know, of course, that this is um, uh, Professor Husa's uh, special speciality. Um, I have to say uh, straight away, and I kind of I mentioned this in my presentation, that this is where um, I do think that the role of non-state actors, so which would include um, corporations and, and other types of private entities, that is something that I could and maybe should have made more of. So um, it's something that I would like to go into more. I mean, I definitely think that um, transnational or global law should be discussed and it has a place under this rubric of the politics of international law. It's something that I don't do enough of um, right now. But you're completely right. I mean, I do have a chapter in the book on, on global governance where I do try to talk about, you know, go beyond because most of the book is focused on um, so-called hard law, treaty law and customary international law. But so, you know, in that chapter in particular, I also try to weave in different sources of law, such as soft law, which could be things like, um, you know, uh, investment best practices from the World Bank. Um, guidelines for foreign direct investment and, and, and so on. And so I do try to get more into the role. Also, I guess in the chapter on global trade governance, I do try to get a bit more into the role of global corporations, but it's something that I don't do enough of. But I completely agree that it's something that is important for students to get a grasp of the full complexity um, of the world of international law. And their international law, is, as I do cover somewhere in the book, is potentially not uh, an encompassing enough term and something like global law actually would be a better and more encompassing term to describe the various overlapping regimes of, of global governance and their different uh, provenances and, and the different types of law on which they rely and, and, and the different actors that are involved. Um, so, I mean, yeah, frankly, it's something that I don't cover enough in the book, but would like to do more of. I focus, I think, more on a more traditional approach of looking at how non-state actors influence states in the creation, you know, so the lobbying um, activities of corporations and other non-state actors, civil society actors in influencing states in, in, in the lawmaking process. Um, yeah. So I would say, it's absolutely possible to uh, ignore that side, but sometimes not useful. So I have an article that I just posted on SSR, and it's my effort to teach myself, as I'll learn more from Dr. Skluna's book, about re rewriting colonialism back into the history of international law. It's a focus on global economic law. And you may know that I also work on a topic I call international regime complexity, which for many IR scholars is really only about international units, but I think it's never been that way how I've thought about it. I've always thought about it as competing sources of authority, which increasingly, like if you took public health today, increasingly would involve non-state actors. You wouldn't want to have any public health conversation without the Gates Foundation because it's the largest funder of public health right now. So a regime complex allows you to see these different zones of authority, of which national law and transnational law is. So on the piece that I just posted on SSRN, it's called From Colonial to Multilateral International Law. It's focused on the economic realm, and, a, and I create an encompassing category called global economic law. I think for global economic law, it's just not useful to stay in the international law framework of something only that states make. Because Really, uh, the baton is being passed by states intentionally to non-state actors to make their own law. And if you look at China and its Belt Road Initiative, which is an economic set of contracts and relations, but obviously it's a foreign policy as well. And it's, it has the potential, and some people would argue it already is recreating an imperial system of uh, contracts that then China holds and coercively uses to promote its foreign policy objectives, and that it then delegates to its own set of courts to enforce. And I just think in, in economics, I'll make a 
maybe the overly broad statement. In economics, you're not gonna really understand what's going on unless you include these other categories of law. But that doesn't mean that in other areas you have to include these categories. Go back to the law of the seas. That is an interstate agreement that all the other actors are kind of bound to. I don't really think, well, I know that Terry Halliday would disagree. If you wanna understand shipping agreements, then you'd go to UNCITRAL and you would say that there's a lot of private lawmaking even when we're talking about the law of the seas, when they come up with common shipping standards that then get adopted by ports around the world. So Halliday and Schaffer would say everything is a transnational legal order. And um, I don't think I would want to fight them on that because I'm much more interested in seeing you know, how complexes of law get built with layering domestic law, transnational law, global law. If you want to understand the politics of law today in international relations, I do think you have these other categories. That being said, a course on you know the state's making of law, that's what a course on international law is. And I can understand uh, why one would just focus on that. Thank you both very much. And thank you again, um, Professor Husa, for the very detailed set of questions. Thank you. Um, so I guess I will actually ask the last question if there is not another question jumping up through the queue. And I'd like to ask both speakers, perhaps this time I will ask Professor Alter to go first, um, for what you both see as sort of the developments on this sort of five year, 10 year horizon on these very broad overlapping areas of international law and international politics. You've already very much discussed historically how much the way that you've engaged your teaching and your students has changed and the concerns about presentism in your research, Nicole, also you've talked about that. But I'd be very curious for what you think are going to be sort of the next permutations in this sort of five to 10 year time horizon. Thank you. So I would say that, that we're in a moment that we would call a critical juncture in political science. Um, and that's when taken for granted assumptions are called into question and it becomes a time of great flux where opportunities arise. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the result is going to be change. Whenever you look at when big change occurs, it occurs during critical junctures. But there are critical junctures in which great change does not occur. For example, I think that the more scholars are looking back on the 1970s, the, the more they're realizing all the things that could have changed in the 1970s, the oil crisis, the new international economic order, stagflation in the West that really called into question our entire economic monetarist model of this trade-off between inflation and employment. So many things were in play, detente, the opening of the Cold War, going to China, and yet the system reconsolidated itself much as it had before. And in fact, many people trace the rise of conservatism to that moment where it was a rejection of the movement of the 60s, they would say, and a desire to go back to something more comforting. So just because you're in a critical juncture doesn't mean that everything is going to change. And so I, I can't help but being kind of an optimist. Um, and so for me, the glass is kind of half full. We've seen and we're still seeing the incredibly dangerous moment that we're in. It's dangerous because of populism. It's dangerous because of illiberal democracies. Uh, and the challenges to the rule of law. It's dangerous because um, we wonder, is conflict going to arise between the US and China? I don't think um, the countries really want it. But uh, those international Asian scholars know how easily you can trip into something if you get yourself into a series of places that you don't feel you can retreat from. It is a dangerous, critical juncture now. But the optimistic side of me says people don't want to go back to disorder. And, and what are we going to go back to? We're not going to go back to pre-World War II. Not even China is very clear doesn't want to get rid of the multilateral system. Now, we, we have all these international institutions. We have multilateralism. We have the mechanics of how you work your way through this. All weak powers are not going to want to go back to a great power system. They're going to want the rights that they already have under international law. And to be sure, people are tired of American intrusions, hypocrisy, and things are going to change. Um, but I don't actually think that China is going to find itself uh, into a vastly different world. And this is also what I talk about in this colonial to multilateral. My goal in thinking about that, that was a humongous shift from the colonial order to the multilateral order. I mean, 
the amount of power shifts and the things that changed. And it makes today's moment look nothing in comparison. And that article tries to say what changed and what stayed the same. And the continuity, I argue, is capitalism. The capitalism has a set of interests that um, need to be regulated, that are very opportunistic. And I think that China is going to find itself having embraced capitalism is not being and having embraced multilateralism is not being able to change the international order as much as it imagines. So I think that because of the sunk cost interest that are part of capitalism and that are part of multilateralism, I expect the system to reconstitute itself in not vastly different ways, which is not to say that nothing will change, but it's to say that uh, I think it's gonna be more of a 1970s style critical juncture than a 1945 style critical juncture. Um, yeah, thank you, um, Courtney, for the question. And I agree with a lot of what um, Professor Alter said there. And, and that is um, then kind of the conclusion I, I come to or try to come to in the last chapter of the book is that I also think that ultimately the system as it exists is fairly resilient. Um, and so, you know, the kind of multilateral system underlie, underlined by you know, an imperfect but functioning uh, international law is likely to continue. And I really agree with, with everything um, that was said about order suits most actors, order suits powerful actors, order suits weaker actors. So, you know, and in, in my discussion of, of rising powers, revisionist power, status quo powers, um, yeah, disorder is not in um, China's interest or the interests of other rising powers. So um, I, I tend to agree, but I think that's also, uh, yeah, and maybe that's another type of um, uh, presentism bias that it, it's hard to imagine really drastic changes. But I do think that it's a fairly resilient system. Maybe two areas I would highlight, um, one that already came up is international human rights law. So, um, you know, that's an area where we might see and not necessarily drastic change, but um, gradual change. Um, also, you know, as reflecting in the changing balance of political power. So, you know, when it comes to human rights norms, that's something where um, actors such as China and Russia are making, you know, say efforts uh, through United Nations channels to shift definitions uh, or say to shift the focus from, you know, traditional individual understandings of human rights to uh, say a right to development or other, you know, just just kind of shifting. And there has been pushback, and I know that you know this very well, um, uh, Courtney. You know, but there has been pushback. But um, that's something. I mean, when I uh, present certain cases to my students, um, say for example, one that we look at is is the Russian annexation of Crimea, which and this is not moving now to an area different than human rights law, but so something like that, which is like a pretty clear cut violation of international law. Um, and then when you look at resolutions on that in the General Assembly, um, you start to see more of a, you know, not necessarily um, large groups of countries exactly supporting um, the Russian annexation of Crimea, but not uh, condemning it either, you know, so abstaining on resolutions and so on. But what is striking and what I discuss with my students is that um, there often it does seem to be a divide between, you know, if I can use these labels, Western and non-Western states. Um, and so, you know, then when it comes to the efforts of actors such as China to, you know, shift definitions of international human rights norms and, and, and so on, um, you know, that's potentially things like that will find support, particularly among non-Western states. So, so that's where I think um, there could be a shift, um, you know, maybe for the worse. Another area maybe to watch will be, you know, over the next five or 10 years, as you said, will be um, what happens with the International Criminal Court. Um, you know, so there's a new prosecutor coming into office. Uh, the record of the court in its first couple of decades of existence has been somewhat underwhelming, you know, I would say. So, so what will happen with the International Criminal Court? Um, with Trump out of office, you know, I mean, again, I don't expect uh, Biden to, to run towards the court with open arms. And obviously, you know, he hasn't so far. And that would be totally inconsistent with, with U U.S. positions even before Trump. But will the U.S. become 
you know, less overtly hostile towards the International Criminal Court and maybe even supportive in some ways. Um, you know, the, the court has, you know, after again, focusing pretty much exclusively on African cases in, in the early decades of its operation is now investigating situations in other parts of the world. So will the court really be able to establish its power to, I mean, will it be able to successfully bring prosecutions in some of these other situations? You know, something like that would be a major breakthrough. So yeah, I, I guess I would nominate those two areas as ones, um, as ones to watch. What about trade? Because the WTO is really at a crisis point. So what would you say about trade? Yeah, well, there again, um, you know, so the problems predate Trump, but got worse under Trump. So, you know, what's happening with the appellate body uh, being, you know, not, not having um, uh, sufficient numbers. Uh, and I must admit, I haven't followed uh, closely enough the very latest on that. But again, you know, it's an area where I hope that the US would now be less overtly hostile. But the problems that the US has had with the WTO are long standing, you know, and they do predate Trump. So, um, yeah, it, it's harder to be optimistic on that one. I mean, again, you know, I was writing that chapter talking about really in the past tense, the WTO dispute resolution mechanism being this jewel in the crown and, and you know, being this kind of shining example of, of um, you know, cooperation and dispute resolution, even on really contentious issues. And, uh, and now it's completely uh, not non-functional. And then you have, you know, the fact that um, since the creation of the WTO in 1995, there hasn't been a successfully completed multilateral uh, trade round, right? The, the Doha development round it began in it was 2001. So it's there, you, I think I see more fragmentation. I mean, if I, 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 if I was to make a prediction, I think it would be more fragmentation. So, you know, regional trade agreements, bilateral trade agreements, um, and, and uh, the WTO being kind of less used as that uh, global forum for negotiating trade agreements. And, the, and then I think that the question is, so for me, it's the dispute settlement system that can be resurrected because people will vote with their feet anyway, and they just won't bother to do it. But certain topics don't have to be constantly updated. The laws of war, we do talk about how you have to update it for cyber, but it's, um, or maybe human rights, or maybe I'm actually overly sanguine that they don't have to be updated, but economics absolutely has to be updated. So a, a 25 year old agreement that has not been updated in that time, has so many places of irrelevancy and that you go outside to preferential trade agreements to bilateral agreements to do all of the updates i should say it's always been the way that global economic law has been made that you do bilateral preferential and then you bring those into the wto so and that was clearly the intent uh, of the united states with tpp to try to even bolster further the ip rights which we can have a disagreeing conversation about that. I'm not a fan of that policy, but that was to bring it into the WTO. So it's not that they're um, completely like off the reservation strategies, but if we go to a world in which trade is not collectively negotiated, not multilateralized, you then have to ask what's gonna happen to developing countries in the development agenda. Are we gonna be back to a world of great power? And some would say we never left this world but of really self-serving great power agreements. So I, I think for me, and this is why I've been like moving in this direction, in economic law, um, I think it really matters if you're not multilateralizing that. And we need to think about what a, what a world of preferential agreements looks like uh, as being different than a world that's regulated by the WTO. Already like 20 years ago in the Sutherland report, they said that only, only in, with Europe, only nine relations were actually governed by most favored nation status, the, the constitutional principle of the WTO. Everything else was governed by preferential trade agreements. That is a complete erosion of the constitution that the WTO is. And so I, I think the way that international law will change will not be through cataclysmic breaking, but through in the historical institutional world way, subversion, conversion, layering, and, and that makes it a much more complex way to think about it. But you're going to, in my mind, a place to watch in addition to the absolutely the areas that you signaled would also be economics.
Well, thank you very much, um, both to Dr. Nicole Cicluna and also to Professor Karen Alter for a really fascinating, um, engaging, thought-provoking discussion in celebration of Nicole's fantastic new book, which I'm also eagerly awaiting my copy to arrive in Hong Kong. So, so glad that Professor Alter could hold it up. Um, but really, thank you very much for our fantastic group of attendees and these great questions. And again, our thanks it's right there. Good. And thank you. I'm glad someone received it. <laughs> I'm so sorry you guys don't have it. It feels so unfair. I almost like I, I actually have two copies. I want to put one in the mail. If I mail it to you, to get there. <laughs> but maybe it's a Hong Kong thing. So maybe it wouldn't arrive. Maybe our books are in quarantine. I think. Who knows? But but, but I'd also really like to, again, on, beh on behalf of both the speakers, um, to thank um, the Center for Comparative and Public Law at the University of Hong Kong for hosting this great session, in particular, Dr. Alex Schwartz and also Winnie Law for organizing everything so flawlessly. And thank you all for joining us for this great discussion. So if you need to hop off now, feel free to go, but we'll, we'll be here for half a minute more. Thank you very much.